Okay. Okay. So hello everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Raha Masoodi. I am a research assistant volunteer uh, with the Addiction and Concord Disorders gr uh, Group, being supervised by Dr. Michael Krauss. I'm a neuroscience student at UBC, and I'm so excited to be here with you all. So our speakers for today are Sheila Visa and Rob Johannes. So Rob has experience as the executive director of the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. He's also coordinated the Alternatives to Violence Project, which is a restorative justice initiative in federal prisons. Uh, currently, Rob works in program development with Fred Victor. He co-chairs at the St. James Town Services Providers Network, sits on the advisory council for the Canadian Association for Suicide Prevention, and he also sits on the board of the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. Sheila is a systems level social worker who has worked on the, in frontline advocacy and research roles in various organizations, including AIDS Vancouver, BC Office of the Human Rights, uh, Rights Commissioner and Vancouver Coastal Health. She's uh, the research co-founder of Shift Research Collective, which is a qualitative research consultancy focusing on community grounded methods and social justice principles. So the title of their talk today is Virtual Support Groups, Equity-Oriented Best Practices. So Sheila and Rob, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ra. Um, yeah, so as uh, Ra had mentioned, uh, my name's Rob. Uh, he, him, and his are my pronouns. Um, I am currently in Toronto, um, working for, uh, at Fred Victor. Um, I am also a, uh, an adjunct professor at the School of Social Work at University of Toronto and York University and a recovering academic. Um, I know this is a UBC conference, but I was an SFU uh, alumni. I did my bachelor's with honors there, my master's and, and half my PhD, which maybe one of these years I, I will return to. So it's great to, to be part of one of these forums uh, again. This is, I think the third time um, that I've been part of, of one of these Let's Talk Overdose Symposiums. And it, it's a great opportunity for me because it helps connect me to my roots and, and r remind me that the, the Toronto bubble can be very um, encompassing when you're part of it. So it's great to be able to step outside of that and, and consult and just learn from, from, from others. So um, Sheila, do you have anything you wanted to um, say before we continue with our talk here? Yeah, not much other than, you know, extending a warm welcome for everybody who's here. So lovely to have all of you here and you're probably very busy days. My name is Sheila. My uh, pronouns are she, her, hers. So I had the privilege to be Rob's um, Masters of Social Work student um, through my studies at New York University. So we did our practicum uh, virtually, me in Vancouver and Rob in Toronto, and that was really a hoot. And we really got to learn a lot of the differences and similarities between practices in Vancouver and practices in, in, in Toronto. And I think you'll see, you'll see a lot of that um, all throughout our presentation today. But um, as Raha said, I, I also um, co-founded um, with my business partner, the Shift Research um, Collective. And also I currently work as the equity oriented clinical educator with Vancouver Coastal Health's uh, Mental Health Act support team. So really lovely to be here. Cool. And uh, apologies on my end, uh, Thursdays are uh, garbage collection days. So I think the loud trucks have already <laughs> come by, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do our best. And, but the, you know, that's the realities of, of working remotely. And, and that's what this session is about, is, is how do we create equitable, uh, inclusive, anti-oppressive spaces in online platforms. So before we do that, and another quick note, this will be kind of interactive. So we're, we're hoping that you'll, you'll be able to participate in a, in a few guided activities, as well as um, giving us your input on maybe some of some practices that uh, you have been part of or help developing or, or just, just done in, in your day-to-day -day practice with, with your agencies, wherever you are coming from. So as I mentioned, I, I come to you as a Vancouverite um, residing in the unceded territory uh, of Toronto. And before we go any further, just want to honor the unceded land of the Coast Salish peoples that um, Sheila and I'm sure most of you are probably on. Um, unceded means never surrendered, relinquished or handed over in any way. And most of British Columbia um, remains 
uh, unceded um, sovereign indigenous uh, lands. Um, the land includes the Musqueam, the Skohomish, Tsleil-Waututh, uh, Kwikwetlam, Kwatlan, Katsi, the Kikite, Semiamu, and the Sawasan First Nations. Where I am in Toronto, we're on the lands of the Haudenosaunee-speaking nations, uh, the Huron-Wendat, Pitun, Seneca, Mohawk, most recently Mississaugas of the Credit First River Nations. And Ontario is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a moment there. Um, so we're mindful of broken covenants, uh, strive to make this right in all our relations with the land and with each other. And we'd also like to acknowledge those of us who came here forcibly, particularly as part of the transatlantic slave trade and honoring paying tribute to ancestors of African origin and descent. Let this land acknowledgement serve as a recognition of the thousands of lives that continue to be uncovered at 139 residential schools across Canada, which continue to be excavated, and the last of which closed in 1996. So this is not history. Uh, we are living with, and in many cases, benefiting from the consequences and exploitations of these institutions. So as we have grounded ourselves, now here we are in this, in this virtual space from, from wherever we are. Um, we can go to the next slide, uh, Sheila. I think this is you, actually. Thank you so much, Rob. No problem. So um, we're on to, we want to start um, our workshop with a very kind of interactive and reflective um, question here. So I'm going to actually stop my sharing here a little bit here. And then I invite for the folks who are here, if you feel comfortable, um, feel free to turn on your video if you feel comfortable. If not, don't worry about it. You can turn it off. Um, but uh, this is, and you can keep it on for this um, portion only and you can turn it off later. But we have a very simple question to ask you. Thank you for some of you who are turning on. Hello, <laughs> nice right. to see your lovely faces. <laughs> um, so our question is this, who here in this room has experienced being treated like you belong? Who here in this room has experienced being treated like you belong? I see, feel free to put up your hand or you know, do the um, raise hand function. Just take your time. I see that some people did raise their hands. Thank you. Feel free to put it back down if, if you feel comfortable. Thank you for participating. Um, okay, so, Sounds like some of us here, if not most of us, have experienced being treated like we, we belong. So I'd like to invite you to go to that memory, to that specific memory. And if you could find one word, what did that look like? What did being treated like you belong look like? In one word. Feel free to either unmute yourself or put it in the chat or in the Whova chat if you're logging in by Whova and Raha kindly offered to monitor that as well. So feel free to either unmute yourself or put it in the Zoom chat or in the Whova chat. What did being treated like you belong look like? Being asked. <laughs> being asked, thank you. Is it Shay? Is it yeah, yeah. Thank you, Shay, being asked. Somebody said connection, embodying, mm. Mm -hmm. comforting, mm. that looked like comforting. Anybody else would like to, I don't know if the Hoover chat has any um, incoming message, Raha, do you see anything? No, okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And how about what it felt like? Initially, we asked what it looked like, but what did it feel like in one word when you're treated like you belong? Included. <laughs> mm, so included. Thank you. Somebody else said something. I think. Somebody said authentic, felt valued, validating, humanizing. Thank you, thank you. And Raha, anything on Puva? Thank you, perfect. Awesome. Safe. Safe, somebody wow. said safe. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for participating in this portion. Um, feel free to keep your video on if you'd like or 
uh, turn it up, whatever feels comfortable for you. I'm just going to quickly share my screen again. Let's see here. All right, perfect. So we ask these questions and that particular question on your experience of being treated like you belong, because you know, at the end of the day, I hope we all agree that when we're talking about equity, the end goal is about creating that feeling, that feeling of belonging for all, isn't it? You know, like what you all said, feeling valued, feeling embodied, feeling connected. Um, and it's really important to ground our whole workshop um, in that. But we also know, you know, from our own lived experiences, from countless reports, countless studies, that systems of unbelonging you know, systems that dehumanize, they impact people's lives. They impact our access to basic rights, like healthcare and social services or virtual programming that foster connection. These are systems that dehumanize women, racialized people, trans people, people with disabilities, indigenous people, people in poverty, people who use drugs. And as you can see from this picture, these system kind of create a web, right? And this web can live in even that one single interaction in our service delivery, whether it's virtual or in person, um, in our research study, in our healthcare settings, whatever it might be. So again, as we go through this workshop, we invite you to hold you know, both the reality of these interlocking web, right? These interlocking systems, and also our shared end goal of creating that belonging for all. And on to you, Rob. Great, thanks, Sheila. So to put things in context, because everything is context, um, the case study or the example that we're providing on how we attempted to create and are in the process of still creating a best practice guide for remote service delivery was through our peer support groups at Fred Victor, which is a multi-service agency in Toronto that was founded in 1894 by the Massey family. So if you've heard of Massey Hall, it's actually that family. Hart Massey's uh, nephew was Fred Victor Massey, who um, was a youth and died of a, of a, at the time, not a very well-known uh, sickness, and then opened this site at 145 Queen Street, Queen and Jarvis downtown, which is still there. Um, that's just how it's changed from the, uh, the left to the right. We have over 600 employees, 3,000 community members daily access our services. Everything from post-incarceration support to shelters, to short-term housing, long-term housing, uh, employment preparation. And then in our case, in health promotions, it's a lot of program development advocacy, uh, a lot of systems level, level work. So the folks that participate in these groups were maybe at some point in their journey really in the thick of mental health instability or addictions. Uh, were quite likely street involved as well. And we're in that sort of point of needing immediate care. They've now progressed, a lot of them, or, or just moved to a different part of their journey where, where they have stable housing. Um, they don't need the kind of immediate crisis response services, but we know that as soon as you take that away, then we run the risk of falling into that revolving door where people keep coming back. So these groups represent a, a place for people to stay in touch, to stay connected. Um, if they need referrals to other services, we can provide them. Um, but otherwise, it's just a place to gather every week, talk about what's going on, how are you doing, how's your week been, doing some recreational activities. And one of the challenges, which we'll get to shortly, is this was always an in-person gathering, you know, every week, twice a week, once downtown, once in Scarborough for different people, and some people would attend both. But then when COVID happened, um, there was no gathering anymore. So that's really what, what prompted a lot of this. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So I come from out west, I come from Vancouver. Um, I lived on Commercial Drive. Um, of course, <laughs> which probably shouldn't surprise <laughs> <Of> you. <course. laughs> uh, right off commercial, off commercial and first, actually. Um, and here's a little geographic diagram. So that red circle there, that's the downtown east side of Vancouver. 
A lot of services, as you probably are aware, are really highly concentrated in that area, which makes service coordination a little more streamlined. It also makes building that sense of social capital a little more direct. If we had an issue, for example, when I was um, working with Fandu, if there was an issue, a building was going to be shut down, or we needed a petition signed, or we needed to gather to you know, go to City Hall or something, I could walk two blocks in either direction, hand out a few leaflets, and in an hour, I'd have 200 people ready to go. Toronto, which by contrast to Vancouver's 115 square kilometers, Toronto is um, over 600 square kilometers. And it's a mega city that used to be five or so different cities that have now merged into one. You can spend an entire day just traveling from one side of Toronto to the other with, uh, with traffic. So there's little pockets of community in various places. So it's an interesting challenge in that how do we build practices that are responsive to the localized needs of each community, but have some sense of consistency with communication across all of our different uh, locales in all our different regions. And as a result, you kind of have a bit more of a disenfranchised population that we work with because of all that separation, it becomes very top down, it becomes very professionalized and it becomes owned by, you know, uh, professional service providers, which a lot of us are, and I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Um, it's just something that we need to be mindful of as we as we do this work. Uh, next slide, please. So someone had mentioned in the chat, the feeling of connection, and that's a really, really big thing. Um, I'll, I'll go back to several years ago when I, when I was still working frontline doing case management, there was a, uh, a person on my caseload who was struggling with what's called Capgras syndrome. That's a form of paranoid schizophrenia where you believe that people who are close to you are actually not who they are. So essentially it's someone, an imposter pretending to be that person. He had several instances of violence against family members, of course, because the closer you get to him, the more you are, are, are suspect to becoming part of that, that conspiracy. Even for me as a worker, when he started to go around telling people and even looking at me and saying, wait, you're not Rob. And I would go, shit, like, this means we've made a connection. We're getting somewhere, but also how do we continue working together when that sense of distrust comes down right away? So after a particularly intense episode, we ended up in a detox uh, center in the West of Toronto. In this just concrete and brick room, and it was the first time we got to just kind of hang out and just talk uh, about things that weren't related to the immediate crisis that was presenting itself. And he asked me, he said, do you, do you have a girlfriend? <laughs> and, um, and I said, yeah, yeah, I, I do actually. Um, and he says, you know, I'd, I'd really like to like to have a girlfriend one day. And he told me this story about one of the first times he was in hospital, there was a nurse that was working in the mental health ward where he was. And this nurse actually had been his high school crush back in the day. And it's the first time he'd seen her since. And he, he said he, he just felt so alive, like he was floating and it, it, just so excited and everything was, was the best thing ever. And then when he was discharged from hospital, he felt this crash, like this, this hole of emptiness inside, inside of him. And he told me, he said, that's the first time I did cocaine. And for 10 minutes, I felt exactly like I did when I was with her. Because as we'll see in the, in, in the next, uh, you know what, let's, let's go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, Ra, I know you're uh, in, uh, a scientist, a neuroscientist. My, my fiance actually is, is a neuroscientist, so she can explain this way better than I can. <laughs> And this has probably come up in a lot of these, these forums and symposiums that the same parts of our brain that respond to things like love, connection, are the same parts of our brain with overlap. If you can see the blue areas there, those are the parts of our brain that cocaine and heroin trigger. Emotional pain and physical pain are kind of the same thing. Like we can actually see brains now. We've always kind of known it, but now we can actually see it and say, okay, see, that's where it's happening. 
And in, in this gentleman's case, he knew that he would never be able to get that feeling again after the first time. But he kept doing it for years and years and years, thinking that, you know, maybe he'll be able to get there again. So what we were really experiencing here was an issue of connection. So hence the, the thesis now has come out that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. It is in fact connection because that can actually sustain us with those feelings neurologically um, and, and chemically in ways that substances, um, they run out eventually uh, or you hit a wall eventually and it stops having the, the desired effect. Um, next slide, please. So what this person I was working with was experiencing then became international and we were all going through it when 2020 happened. The thing we need to be mindful of though so that we can learn lessons from this time and carry them forward is that a pandemic is just another system disruptor that amplifies existing socioeconomic inequities like 9-11, like Hurricane Katrina, um, like what's happening in the Ukraine right now. These are massive disruptions of, of systems which tend to hit already marginalized groups of people harder than, than others. And a lot of it has to do with systemic often isolation that is often by design and and quite strategic and meant to, to disempower large uh, segments of the population. So we don't wanna just look at COVID as one pandemic that's happening and then it'll be over. We need to really use this opportunity to learn as many things as we can from it. A lot of things came to the surface during COVID. Anti-Black racism really came to the surface in a really big way and other kinds, kinds of inequities. Um, they were always there. And those of us that work in the sector deal with them every day. So we are very aware that they're always there, but now they're so in our face that we actually have to find ways to address them meaningfully. And that's, I think, been one of the most hopeful outcomes of, of this pandemic is that it's put all these kinds of issues at the, at the forefront. Uh, next slide. So in the beginning of 2020, when this first happened, it actually happened on a day that we had one of our support groups. And then immediately after the group, um, the notification was sent out to everyone that we have to start working from home and all in-person services are, are, are gone for, for indefinitely. We had to find a way to still stay connected to everybody because we didn't want that amplification of isolation to have anyone slip back into you know, dangerous places that they may have been before. But the challenge was at the time, it seemed that no matter how far we reached, nobody had protocols for virtual programming. Um, even hospitals, um, legal clinics, I talked to everybody and no one really had like, here's best practice for doing services remotely. Again, something we always needed to do and we're always gonna continue to do after this. Um, so we were kind of building it completely from scratch. You know, hospitals were having, you know, Zoom appointments. And then at the time, like Zoom hadn't really been approved for its, its privacy robustness, which is why a lot of city and government employees use WebEx. And th this was all just, just very unclear. It was a very big uncharted territory. Uh, next slide. So an important thing when we're talking about equity and this is something that Sheila will go into as well, is we can't just assume that everybody has the same definitions of things like equity, of inclusion, of anti-racism, anti-oppression that we do. Because when we do that, that's when these kinds of terms get appropriated into policies and co-opted, and then sometimes turned back and weaponized against our communities. And we've, we've seen that for decades and decades, um, even more so. So we needed to be very clear about, well, what are we talking about when we talk about equity? First thing you do when you're in a group in person is often you, you know, you, you do a check-in and you ask, well, what do you need to feel comfortable in this environment? Um, 
Kathleen Nash, you had put the word safe into the chat, which I think is a really potent one, because we often talk about this, this idea in, in almost in contrast to safe space, this idea of brave space. And that's the space where maybe we have to sit with some discomfort. Um, sometimes what is, what is our, our comfort zone in the middle, sometimes called the safety zone in suicide intervention work, is the place where things are predictable and we know how it's gonna work out. But in order to challenge ourselves on new concepts and new ideas, we kind of have to like put our feet in the discomfort a little bit. And, and that's something that we were looking at. Well, how do we consciously do that in a virtual platform? So a, a very quick definition of, of equity is you've probably seen this picture all over the place, especially in the last couple of years. Equality is the picture on the left where everyone's got the same size box. But hey, guess what? Everyone's not the same height. Equity is each according to their need, which, yes, that statement comes straight from Karl Marx, but you know, I mean, this is this is what we're talking about with, with equity. It's essentially meeting everyone where they're at and accommodating needs as they require. Uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, I'm actually going to pass it over to you, Sheila. Thank you, Rob. And I, just a quick comment on what you said about that space, that discomfort, that uncomfortable space. A lot of people would say that it's called the liminal space, but I know a friend of mine calls it the learning zone. That's actually where yeah. we really learn that deep learning, hey, where it's not too comfortable, but it's also a little bit uncomfortable. So thanks for bringing that up. And actually yeah, and a follow-up, oops, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, and if you go a little too far out of the learning zone, you get into the that's panic right. zone. And yeah. that's where it's, that's right. oh shit, I need to go back. That's right. Um, and then we go back to what's comfortable. So it's really finding that balance of how do we just sit comfortably in that learning zone or, or that brave space. That's right. That's right. Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, connected with what Rob said, I think it's really important to really, really define um, what is equity when we're talking about equity oriented best practice. So again, in the context of, context of our work, equity or equity oriented approach means understanding how those systemic violence, those systems of unbelonging and dehumanization how they impact people's lives and people's experiences of our services. And of course, because of that, again, again connected with what Rob said, we then should direct resources to those communities who are inequitably impacted. So it's, it's a very, very different approach than those equal treatments um, approach, right? Because the reality is some of us actually come from different starting points. Um, it's also a continuous process that requires complex interventions. And a lot of these interventions are not just individual interventions, they're actually structural and organizational. Again, so shifting away from that individualistic um, approach. And Rob, do you wanna add anything to this definition? I think you've covered it pretty well. It, it just goes back to that idea again of, of um, each according to need and it has nothing to do with merit and you know, mm. what you deserve it's you know everybody deserves it and what everyone deserves looks different depending upon where they're yeah. at and that changes over the course of your life as well that's right and i think some people might even say you know like looking at social determinants of health which i know some people in this conference um, have been bringing up so that's right um on to you rob yeah so so how we started to put this together was we we had a few different visions for what the output of this would be one would be kind of like an actual guide, like a bunch of pages, with text on it. And then also, well, how do we bridge that to different languages? How do we create infographics and, you know, cool Canva stuff and, and just, just make this more part of the, the ongoing dialogue. So we talked to a lot of other partners in, in health services, um, talked to legal colleagues. And in between, before we started doing the groups, it, it took us about nine months maybe a little longer before we actually started doing virtual groups. Because in the meantime, our team um, would be calling our participants one-to-one -one and asking them, so if we were to do this, what would work for you? You know, issues of technology access and, you know, broadband and all those different things came up, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to those shortly. We also looked at what was going on uh, internationally um, 
And then we did some of our own sort of in, in independent research and consultation. So, you know, hospital for sick kids. Um, what's on the screen there is the, actually, let's go to the next slide. Those are all people that are part of the St. Jamestown Service Providers Network. Um, St. Jamestown is the most densely populated community uh, in Canada. And it's also the most um, ethnically diverse and often one of the most overlooked um, as a result. It's uh, the, the situation doesn't feel quite as dire, but it's about as close to that community building face-to-face -face experience as, as I was able to have, for example, in, in, in the downtown east side. So a lot of our consultations took place through this wonderful network of about 45 different agencies who were all going through the same thing at the same time. So it wasn't just about peer support for people accessing our services, it was about peer support for us too. How do we, what are you doing? What's been working for you? What's not been working? But the key is to document all of that and then try to turn it into something. Uh, next slide. So some examples that we got, for example, on the right there, that is something that the World YWCA put together on virtual safe spaces. Goes through some key tenants, key principles, uh, make sure that you define all those terms. Canadian Medical Health, uh, Mental Health Association, sorry, had another one um, that they were doing in the Waterloo Wellington region in Ontario. And then we actually did a presentation, uh, actually last time it was a lightning talk here <laughs> at, at this symposium. And we put out a call to people that were um, observing that session. Do you have any resources that you've been um, utilizing or accessing, or maybe even putting together yourself within your teams? And that's where this leading groups online uh, resource came from, which is a really, really wonderful um, handbook. So it was a lot of just collecting, consulting, and, uh, and, and talking to people. Uh, so that turns into the guide. I guess we, we can go to the next slide here. So that's our, our contents. So how do you lay this kind of thing out? Well, almost like you would any other sort of policy brief or, or manual on best practice, whether it's harm reduction or, um, you know, in this case, it was just for, for remote service delivery. So get your objectives, your definitions out of the way. Um, steps towards development and implementation. And, you know, this is a template we're looking to create, we're still in the process, and it's always going to be a living document that will continue to grow and be what it needs to be for, for different communities in, in different parts of the world. The third section would then be your practice and protocol and looking at platform specifics. Okay, the, the, the most mechanical stuff about this is how you uh, unmute, this is how you make somebody a host, this is how you spotlight them and all these different things across every, every different platform and just having them there on paper. Um, it's just so much easier that way. Ensuring that there's a space for ongoing evaluation. Uh, that's something that Sheila will talk about around um, equity audit and then additional resources in, in, in an appendix. Uh, so if you see the next slide, it's just... Um, Essentially, it just looks like a policy manual. We'll probably jazz it up, <laughs> make it look more like uh, some of the YWCA graphics there. But for now, the raw materials are just going into a straight ahead um, document like this. Um, Sheila, why don't you talk us through equity audit? This is where things get really fun. Yeah, it does get really fun and interesting. So like what Rob said, we conducted a very iterative and cyclical process also called the equity audit on that best practice guideline that Rob just showed. And it's really important to have regular equity audit, you know, of your groups, your programs, your best practice guide and policies, and always using the feedback from people who really are the experts, right? Which are the members or participants of your group themselves. I'm not the ones participating in the groups I'm here to facilitate, but really they know what works best for them. It's really important to infuse lots of other resources out there and different literatures on equity-oriented best practice. Um, and I would even suggest, you know, if this applies to, you, to your program or your work, to maybe schedule, um, schedule in every year or every quarter to have um, some kind of equity audit, um, some kind of meeting um, with your team in your calendar to start asking some of the key questions when you want to do an equity audit. And I'll show that in the next slide here. So these are some of the 
overarching um, questions that guide our equity audit of both that uh, best practice document and uh, the delivery or of, of our virtual support programs. You know, you can see that there's a lot of critical reflective questions in here, right? Things like, you know, who is centered in this programming and who is excluded in this programming? How are our programs and our services failing some members? How are they working? You know, and these, these next questions are actually really important. Um, what are the biases that we hold as the people running the program or running the conference? You know, who are we asking for feedback? And who are we not asking? So always trying your best to, to see all of the gaps of understanding that we might have, right, in these equity audit questions. Um, and Rob kind of touched on this a little bit, but we'd love to share a little bit about how we've put that guide to practice um, and how we kind of cyclically tried to conduct an equity audit. Um, so our team has been putting it to practice at two weekly support groups, which you know, Rob already said, we had to shift immediately to remote delivery because of the pandemic. One group is virtual with video on, um, similar to this format. And the other is actually a call-in only um, group. And we'll touch on that a little bit more. A key thing to really note is that these support groups have been running since 1995. So some of the members have actually known each other for years. And you, know, you can imagine the kinds of deep connection that they really have with each other, right? And you know, for me as a facilitator, it was really a huge privilege just to be there and bear witness to how the members really hold space for each other at such a difficult um, time um, in the world and in their lives, right? It's also important that to say that all of our members um, of these groups, they come from communities deeply impacted by poverty, by the drug poisoning crisis and other forms of you know, systemic oppression like racism, ageism, ableism. Um, it's, you know, again, it's important when we're talking about equity, we need to understand how these systems, how these institutional forces impact people's lives, because at the end of the day, they really impact our service delivery, right? And most importantly, whether our programs are actually beneficial for people or not. So as you can imagine, with shifting, immediately shifting, what's always been an in-person, you know, connective, embodied uh, support group suddenly into a remote setting in the middle of a global pandemic, you know, we clearly face some challenges. I know Rob touched on that a little bit. And the most significant challenge is the, the very inequitable access to digital space. Some of our members, because of poverty, because of inequities, they don't have access to a computer or access to Wi-Fi or internet. And of course, this is followed by digital liter literacy. Some members who are older and who are living in poverty, they don't only have access to devices, like iPads, they don't have iPads, they don't have computers, they also don't, don't have internet, but they also didn't know how to navigate technology in, in general. So some people actually only rely on landlines and snail mail as their main uh, method of communication, right? So because of the issue of digital divide, they don't receive the same benefits of the digital world as you know, maybe you and I enjoy right now. Um, there were also several issues with Zoom as um, Raha and uh, organizers, you, some of you have organized groups or conferences before online, you probably can share the pain. Um, some members who don't have access to internet could actually not call in to some of our groups. Um, there were also some errors um, in Zoom, which I know, Rob, uh, you want to talk about a little bit more later. And finally, it's really, it's just really hard to foster the same sense of connection that you can get in an in-person setting, in a remote um, setting. So for example, in in-person groups, we would be sitting there with coffee and snacks and sit next to each other and chat over food to connect. You know, when someone is upset, you can give them a hug or offer them a Kleenex, right? You can't really do that in this, in this virtual setting. So it's just really harder. It feels different in a virtual world. Um, do you wanna add anything, Rob, around some of the challenges? Um, sure, I, I think one of, the, one of the challenges was just 
certain personalities and learning styles uh, adapt to different platforms. Um, I don't want to say necessarily more effectively, but they just gravitate towards them. So balancing participation has been a really challenging thing. Um, you can't just quite, you know, pass a talking stick around the room and, and, and do it like that. So for example, there was one group member that, that felt they were getting talked over a lot and dropped off from the Zoom call. And in some situations, it's like, we know some, some of our group participants are prone to seizures, uh, prone, prone to dissociation. So what we had to do was build in an infrastructure whereby if someone drops off the call, we have an emergency phone number for someone else that lives in their house. Um, if they're quiet for a long time, we need to call their cell phone. Like we need to do all of these essentially one-to-one -one wellness plans with everybody, which look very different than they would have in person. In person, it's, you know, here's your emergency contacts, here's the medications you're on and just having a sheet like that. And then also navigating our own documentation because our peer support groups are open to anyone. It's no barrier. You never know what you're going to get every week. And some have been coming for 25 years or more. Others we've never seen, and we have no idea what's going on with them. So we really do have to be on our toes um, quite, quite often. And part of the accessibility of those groups is that you're not going to be registered as a client with us. Uh, it's all anonymous. So as a result, we don't have your contact info, your medications, who your housing worker is, who your uh, doctor is uh, on a database somewhere. That also affects how we communicate and document the groups. Um, we can't keep, like we started, you know, using a Google Drive to share notes. Like for example, if we're attending webinars, we take notes, we share them all there. We couldn't share client information there, of course, that had to stay internally within our email server. And these were all things that we just kind of had never thought about before. And it's like, okay, let, let's formalize this uh, into, in, into something that we can refer to and then mm -hmm. you know, pass on to, to others. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you just touched on that. So because of these challenges, we had to really pivot fast to create a fit simple solutions. Um, and I know initially we already talked about how we had to make one of our groups call in only so that group members who don't have access to internet, don't have access to computer, they just need to pick up their landline and call the Zoom, uh, the Zoom provided uh, phone number and they just call into the group. So that's one of the, the, the creative and very simple solutions, right? But even with that, unfortunately, we still had a problem where a group member was actually not able to call into that dial-in only group because it turns out the prompts provided by Zoom when you're calling in that number was actually not accessible to them. So we quickly found another simple solution, which is to create conference calling. So I would start the group. So I would start the group on desktop, on desktop Zoom. And then I would also call the Zoom with my cell phone using that dial-in number. And once I'm in with my cell phone, then I conference call that one member in. And this makes them so happy, right? Because at the end of the day, we want everybody to be in this group because this group fosters so much connection and so much healing our group members. And finally, just a quick story on uh, some of these creative solutions. One member was actually learning how to paint during the pandemic. This is her lifelong dream. And she thought maybe during the pandemic, I can finally do it, right? And she really wanted to share her work with, with, her, with her group members. In an in-person setting, or even virtual with video on like this, she could just bring her paintings and show them to you folks right here, right? But this was difficult because we were in a dial-in only group, so she couldn't do that. Uh, but people still wanted to see her paintings, you know, and support her and foster that sense of, you know, mutual support with each other. So the way that we found uh, to do this is for her to email the, 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 the pictures of the paintings to me. And then I, I went to Staples here in Vancouver to print them all off in color. And then I snail mailed them from Vancouver to their addresses in Toronto. <laughs> now, you know, it might not be the a lot most of coordination. Stable. There's a lot of coordination. <laughs> Nail mailing, I haven't done it since, I don't know, 1995. <laughs> but um, it was really worth it. 
people were really, really happy and we were able to foster that, that connection and talk about how awesome their paintings are. And we'll talk about that a little later. But um, another uh, quick um, kind of creative solution is we also provided gift cards to participants um, who come each time to the virtual groups. And this really mirrors you know, that coffee and snacks that people get in an in-person setting, right? And again, this is grounded in equity-oriented best practice. We tried our best to provide options for members, always offering choices. We always, we asked their input, which gift card would you prefer? Do you want McDonald's? Do you want Tim's? Do you want other things? And people also said that they actually preferred physical cards, not, not e-gift cards. So, you know, we just kept track of people's attendance and we would just refill the cards $5 um, each every, every attendance or every week. And again, honestly, you know, when you're, we're talking about equity oriented best practice, providing as many choices as possible is really important. Always leaning on people's preferences and what really works for them. It's meeting people where they're at, right? And most importantly, to be flexible, um, and maybe that requires some flexibility in your budgeting, which, you know, we were fortunate that Rob and our team were very flexible with, with budgeting. Um, yeah, and I know, I know, Rob, you wanted to add something uh, to this. Was there an, an addition? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so another thing that really came to the surface in a big way during COVID was the, the idea, the, just the issue of food insecurity, mm -hmm. food justice, food sovereignty. Um, culturally relevant food and diet. So we kind of realized after a while through just having multiple conversations with our group members every week we'd be coming up, oh, I can't afford groceries. Groceries are so expensive. So we thought we're just kind of providing, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I love Tim's as much as anybody, but it's like, that's just kind of empty carbs. So it's like, okay, your issues is, is your challenge is really with having sustainable food. So well, then we talk about food budgeting. So let's switch to a president's choice card, which gives you access to, you know, Lobla, Shoppers Drug Mart, No Frills, all these different places. And then talk about, well, how far can you go over a week with $10 of food, which you can actually go pretty far with that um, if, you, if you do it um, effectively. And then the whole system was just like, okay, it's the account is under my name, but the rest of the team are actually the ones doing the facilitation of the groups. So they actually log into the account and refill the card um, once it goes below a certain level. And then you have to set up all these automated prompts in, in the, the portal. And then I get sent the invoice and then I expense that to the agency. So it's like, there's a lot of different moving parts and it can actually get uh, you know, if you're not like, like a really type A, like organized sort of person that, that can get overwhelming even for us. So we just had to like create a spreadsheet and just, you know, make sure it's shared. Anyone can go on anytime and just add, um, notes. Like I added this, I did this on this date and, and what have you. Um, I am mindful that we've got 10 minutes left and we do want to have a short conversation with everybody. So why don't we just blow through, other Let's things that we're going to cover, and then we'll we'll open it up to to all of you. And thank you all again so much for for being here. Over yeah, we actually my um, late afternoon, but I know it's your lunch hour. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we actually have a good uh, interactive component at the end. So we'd love to hear from you. But really quickly, we have very short uh, critical reflections to share with you folks. The first one is, again, we felt that strengthened um, sense of connection and community during a very difficult time in the world. And I think I told you earlier that one of our group members was learning how to paint and draw, you know, and just the fact that we got to see how the group cheered her on, on the days where she felt insecure about her drawing skills. And then on a different day, we celebrated how amazingly talented she is at art. I mean, this is what, so that cat is one of her uh, paintings that she, um, she approved for, for us to use today. I mean, look at, look at how beautiful the painting is. And she felt insecure about her talent. So, you know, we really got to be there with her. And can you imagine the feeling of mutual support and connection and belonging just in that one simple moment of, of telling her that you're really awesome in art, you're really awesome at painting. But again, we also saw that uh, the systemic barriers, right? Um, it's still, still nagging in there. And I know some of you, Carrie, Sarah, some of you folks really know this. So it's really important to, to always do that um, equity audit 
always do that critical reflection, you know, always checking in with the members. Is this working for you? How could we make this better? And always to have that flexibility to meet people where they're at. If not, the groups and the programs won't benefit um, for them, right? And lastly, and this is very important, you know, I and other facilitators benefit from systemic oppression. I benefit from ableism. I benefit from ageism, amongst um, other things. So I come with many gaps of understanding. That's why it's always key to always center and make intentional space for members' voices. Again, by asking, what has worked? What needs to change? And to always ask ourselves, what are my biases? What am I missing? What are we missing as a group? Um, again, our group members are the experts of their own lives. And if we truly want our groups and our programs to benefit them, then we need to always listen and always be critically reflective of our own gaps and biases. So we're actually in our fun little um, interactive component. <laughs> um, it's a word cloud activity. So I don't know if you have access to a phone right now, but if you happen to have an access to a phone with a camera on, feel free to go to your phone app uh, your camera app, sorry, it's kind of connected. So go to your camera app and you can hover over your camera to the little QR code there and it should show you a menti.com link that you can click. Or if you have a browser, feel free to go to menti.com and then it'll ask you for a code and you can type in the code right there, 33900081. And you should come to a page that looks like this. If you can put one word after listening to Rob and I tell our story here, what comes to mind when you hear equity or equity oriented in one word? You should be seeing your, the results live here. Let's see. Um, feel free to nudge us if you have any questions or unmute yourself. Oh, somebody said necessary. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Rob, let me know if you see anything in the chat. I don't think I can. Yeah, feel free to throw it in the chat too. Like if if you don't want to be 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 bothered with this uh, <laughs> uh, high tech thing, just throw it in the chat. <laughs> Let us know if there's any other thoughts there. Right now, we only have necessary. Oh, somebody yeah. said essential. Essential. Respected. Respected. Yeah. Let's see. All right. I'm going to give it one more second, a few more seconds. So somebody said necessary. Some folks say essential and respected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I will now uh, pass it on to you, Rob. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is this, this is a twofold thing. So you don't have to totally think on your toes right now. I'm going to share in the chat a link to what is, sorry, that didn't come out as a link. It had the word link in front of it, <laughs> Google Slides. Um, but yeah, if you just copy that, paste it in your, in your browser. That's just an open source, essentially Google form that we've got available where you can go and fill in some of your suggestions. What we're really curious about, and this came in very handy uh, at the last one of these sessions, and that was just in a five minute lightning talk. So now we've had, you know, um, almost an hour spending together, um, which maybe has gotten, hopefully has gotten the juices flowing uh, a little further. So we're curious, um, what has your experience been with equity centered online groups? Have you done them yourselves? What have you learned along the way? What do you think would be helpful in some kind of a best practice guide that's shared across the sector? You can throw it in chat. I don't have to keep your name in there. This is just so maybe like, you know, if we want to follow up or have a further discussion about this, but yeah, throw it in the chat, unmute yourself um, and just let us know, have, have you had experience doing this? And what are some of the things you've learned? What are some of the challenges that you've had? I'll stop share so that uh, people would like to unmute themselves or sure. Sure. Yeah. I know some people here have excellent experience, actually, and, and equity oriented. I know, I know some of you folks. No pressure, though. 
I'm happy to jump in. Thank Hi, you. Sarah. Hi, thank you both so much. Uh, yeah, energized and juices flowing for sure from that. So thank you so much. I think one thing that's sort of coming to mind for me is that um, at some point, I think Rob, you said that you took maybe like nine months before sort of even getting started. Yeah. And I don't know if I said that exactly right, but I really appreciate that because I feel like that nine month beginning is so often like doesn't happen. And there are real life reasons why that is the case, but I think it's so essential and necessary for equity based work. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my struggle is kind of, or question to you both is, how do you make the case for those pauses or like slowing down when institutions and people in positions of power over you are just so like, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And, and I think that summarizes a lot of how I do my work. Um, there was this one time, I, th I think John Cleese had talked about this and he was looking at like, creative oriented brains versus, you know, ones that are maybe more mathematical. And the difference is someone who's a little more mathematical is just like, they hand you an iPad and they're just like, okay, I press this button, I go here and I go here. Whereas someone like me, I'm going to look at every part of it. I'm going to like smell it. I'm going to look at how big the camera is. I'm going to play with every single function. I'm just going to stretch it as long as possible and try to look at every possible aspect or utility of this idea or of, or of this thing to find something that works. And it kind of goes back to that adage of, you know, we can stand by the river pulling people out forever, but until we go upstream to see how they're being thrown in and by whom nothing's going to change. And we have to accept that, yes, there are daily crises in our work, but we can't allow ourselves to fully get sucked into that. We do have to recognize this is a marathon and not a sprint. And if we don't do the effective work in the beginning, we're going to pay for it down the road. Um, and, you know, I think the proof, thankfully for our program, we are a very high output program, keeps our funders happy, keeps the agency happy. So there's, there's room for us to play with certain ideas and sure that we are putting out the fires when they come up, but then we're doing the longer term work. And I know that's kind of a position of privilege in the sector because not everybody has that, that freedom, but the case, the case is the thing is to just kind of really make the case and um, stick to it because you know, that it's, it's what has to be done. So if we keep doing the same shit forever, like well, yeah, we're just going to keep recycling harm. If I, if I may add, because that's a really awesome question, Sarah, and that is the, the, the yeah. sore point that I think a lot of us face, right? We know that this is important, and yet the structure, the funding structure, does not allow us to do that relationship building, that time, which is, which is really equity-oriented work. But, you know, I think some of our organizations claim to fight for equity, diversity, and inclusion, right? So what if we shift to their words? Hey, you said that um, you want to be a champion of anti-racism. Have you seen Tema Oken's um, systems that perpetuate white supremacy? They, Tema Oken is one of the equity um, leaders in, in the state. And he has, and I'm happy to share that um, with folks later. He has a list of white supremacy culture, uh, which can also be translated to ableist culture, sexist culture, whatever, right? dominant culture. One of them is urgency, like a very short timeline is perpetuating dominant or white supremacist or ableist culture. Uh, the sense that change needs to happen in big ways, not in small ways. Now that's, that's perpetuating white supremacy uh, uh, culture, right? So we can actually use their words and their values and their claims to say, this is what, you know, this is why we need to do what Rob said. We need to do things differently. Um, and this is how you do it in action. Actually create, you know, consider extending your time. Time is not, maybe time is not linear. Uh, maybe we need to do cyclical processes. We need to build relationships in order to make things work. We need to always ask these reflective questions and reflective questions and meeting our clients or meeting our members where they're at takes time. So I don't know if that answers our question, Sarah, but uh, feel free to, yes, 
And we, we kind of did that, you know, like we, we talked, we were talking to everybody on the phone. Every, I mean, my, yeah. my, my wonderful team was, I was just, you know, again, doing the systemic stuff, but, you know, they were still talking to everybody every week, checking in with them, doing wellness checks, you know, you need any referrals to any services or anything we can provide for you, anything we can mail to you, anything we can drop off for you, even if it was, if that was safe while we're building the larger infrastructures. So we're still kind of doing the, the immediate support and then keeping a focus on the bigger picture. And that helps us even to stay grounded as professionals, because mm -hmm. if we're burnt out and we're not there and we're not present, then we're not doing any, any favors to anybody. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And I just want to check in yeah, with Brad thanks. here. I know that we're at 12.32. How are we for time? We are, I, time just flew by. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we are out of time, unfortunately. If there's any lingering questions in the audience, I am comfortable to stay if you guys are for maybe another minute or so yeah, but probably. um Sheila do you mind putting up the slide with our contact and yeah let's yeah. see I would just ask if you guys feel comfortable on your emails or contact info um yeah oh perfect it's yeah. right there so yeah Please. you can find our contact info here and that link of the uh resources that um, we created together uh, yeah so that, that link is in zoom chat as well as the Hoova chat um I just want to thank you guys so much for your presentation. It was tr truly beautiful in many ways, and definitely a highlight of this whole conference for me. Um, really, really, really important work. So if everyone is okay with ending the session here um, kind of abruptly, but if you guys have any questions, definitely reach out to Rob and Sheila. And um, if I can help you with anything as well, reach out to me. Um, thank you so much for being here once again, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your conference, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, Raha. Thanks, Rob. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you at a different conference, Raha, hopefully. Yes, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs>